So I'm here with Brian Hall, um, America's fastest marathoner and half marathoner. Uh, Ryan, thank you, first of all, for, for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Chattanooga yeah. for a race, I understand. Yes, yeah, we were out here for uh, an event and just ran a 5K this morning with all the kiddos, and it was super fun. So, yeah, was, the kids were loving Chattanooga. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Well, let's just jump right into it. Tell, tell me a little bit about your childhood. We've got a lot of instructors and students watching this that that some may know you, some may know you better than others. So just tell me a little bit about your about your childhood. Yeah. Right so I grew up in a family of uh, five. Uh, I was in the middle of five, actually, one sister and four brothers, and um, had an amazing like Christian home that I was in, where my dad was did an amazing job of leading us spiritually, doing Bible studies, and we're going to church and all that. Um, but I wouldn't say my faith was like super uh, personal, you know. It's more like me praying at God, me reading the Bible, so I didn't feel guilty for not reading the Bible, kind of thing, you know. Um, and it it wasn't like I didn't take it seriously or didn't believe it was just like it, it was more like a ritual than like an experience you know and that all kind of shifted for me one day I was 13 years old heading down to a basketball game Big Bear Lake in Southern California where I grew up and I remember looking out over the lake and at that time I hated to run um, even though I was good at it like I would run the P the mile in PE and do really well my dad would always tell me he's like you can be a great runner if you want to but the desire has to come from you and it, I didn't have the desire at all until that moment when I was 13 looking out over the lake I felt like God just kind of planted a little seed of desire inside me and um, inspired me to try and run around the lake so um, the following Saturday my dad and I we went out for a very long and slow 15 mile run around the lake and I remember collapsing in the couch and and what I'd say for the second time in my life feeling like God was like speaking my heart and telling me that uh, one day I'd run with the best guys in the world but he gave me that gift so I could help other people and uh, you know I spent the next 20 years going after that I went from a kid who hated to run to a kid who like was so focused on running like like I all my friends changed how I you know the things that are important to me in my life changed I started training like crazy I got very disciplined with my nutrition and sleep and all that stuff and I was like going after this thing this vision that I felt like God had given me and um, I'm so glad he gave me that vision because there was a lot of tough times along the way a lot more hard times for me than really good times and it was during those really hard times that I'd have to reflect back on that vision and be like, have I done what I know God has told me I'm going to do? And if the answer is no, I got to pick myself up out of this and keep moving forward. Wow. So, so let's, let's back all the way up to <laughs> that first run. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we start off in, in the 5k challenge with a 60 second run. You started off with 15 miles. How, <laughs> tell me how that felt. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. No, it, it it was painful. It was. I had my literally my basketball shoes on. So by the time I finished this run, my feet were all blistered up, and um, and I was exhausted. Like we had to stop like quite a bit during that run. It took forever. My dad was a runner already at the time, so he was probably just bored out of his mind because we we're going so slow. But he didn't. He didn't tell me that. You know, he was just encouraging me the whole way. Um, but yeah, no, I wouldn't recommend a fifteen mile run right out the gate. But I would recommend like listening to what God's put inside of you and and even more so like listen to the people that God surrounded you with you know and so like my dad he's you know like the closest person to me and he could really tell that hey like this is something that he's feeling in his heart from God and so rather than being like no nah, you know what we should just start with like a much shorter run he's like no I'm a partner with what I see God doing in your life and we're gonna go do it together so I would just encourage people like listen to to God first and then to the people that he surrounds you with as you're getting into the sport. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend a 15 mile run right out the gate. So, so when did you realize, when was that aha moment that you knew running was going to be a big part of your life? Yeah. So that moment when I collapsed on the couch, like that was it, you know, that's where I really believe like I was going to be a world-class runner that one day. So I'm so glad that I have that because what I've found is that you function, what comes out of you is what you believe about yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's why like now as a dad, like my number one priority is to get my kids to have a firm identity, to know who they are and have it be rooted in something that's unshakable. Mm -hmm. um, 
because from that moment, I believed I was going to run with the best guys in the world. So I acted that way. Um, I trained that way. I, I took risk that way. Like when I was in high school, I remember doing indoor mile race against Bernard Lagat, who was at the time, I think he was the second or third fastest human being to ever run the mile. And I'm on the start line with him and I'm like 18 years old in high school. But like I went with him because I was just like, I'm supposed to run with the best guys in the world. That doesn't mean sitting back like a lap behind them, you know? So I went with them the first 800 and then totally blew up, you know? But um, that that kind of belief and being able to take that kind of risk is what allowed me to get to um, that spot of running with the best guys in the world. Wow. Yeah, yeah. We tell our kids a lot, and it may be a quote by somebody, I don't know, but you never know how far you can go until you go too far. Yep, yep. And it you sounds like that's the, the way you run sometimes is – is yep. taking those risks. That's yeah. uh, that's pretty telling. So, I, I've I've done a little research. I, I knew some of these numbers, but I want you to help me explain something. And I had to look it up. You're the you're the currently the U.S. record holder for the half marathon with a 59.43. You're also the only American who's ever run under 205, but you're not the record holder yeah. at 205. How does that work? Yeah. So when I ran 204.58, which is my fastest of all time, it was at the Boston Marathon in 2011. And they have all these r rules and regulations about what makes a marathon uh, record eligible. And so for Boston, it violates a couple of those regulations. One being you drop 400 feet. It's a net 400 foot drop from start to finish. And then the other one being it can't be point to point um, for the reason that it makes it so much better because that day we had like an amazing tailwind so it was like the opportunity of a lifetime to run a fast time actually uh bill rogers he would, he told me previous to that race he's like you know like once every 10 years we get a wicked tailwind and you can really roll and uh i'll never forget standing on the starting line in hopkinton and looking up at the american flag and it was just blowing the exact direction we we're running and I was like, I'm not letting one mile go by where I'm not pressing. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what I can do today. So it was a really cool experience. Even though it wasn't technically an American record, it's still, you know, the fourth fastest time ever run at the Boston Marathon in 123 or 25 years that's been going on. And I'm still the fastest American to ever run that course as well. So there's so much history at Boston that... It's a shame it's not yeah. a, an American record. That's, yeah. That's one of the probably most nostalgic right and it was a are. bit controversial because i was fourth in that race that day um but the guys who were one two they both were well under the world record the current world record oh, wow. at the time so there was a lot of kind of controversy there for a while of like should it be eligible should it not because boston definitely is not a fast course like even though it's a net drop like those hills they hurt you a lot more than they help you yeah um so there's and i actually heard like rumblings recently that they might they're considering changing boston to make it record eligible oh, so really? I don't know. <laughs> but to me, like, to me, I had to shift my perspective of what competition is, you know, growing up as a kid where you're surrounded by it's like, how do you stack up next to everyone else? But I learned that that was like a really unfulfilling way for me to do sports. But what I found is a, a really super fulfilling way for me to do sports is to go after personal excellence and just be like, I'm gonna be the best version of myself today. Like that's the only thing I can control. Right. I can't control how good I am today compared to a year ago or five years ago or tomorrow, but like I can get the most out of myself today. So I'd just be focused on like, I'm gonna do a great job with what I'm doing right now and and look at it for what it is you know on that day and not com be comparing it as it is so easy for me to do to previous years or yeah. um you know future years to come that's, you know that's pretty telling that you know athletes at, at your level we we kind of have a relationship with gwen jorgensen and she yeah. she says the same thing she never makes goals based on outcome goals she yeah. always makes process goals yeah. and it sounds like that's what you're saying is is the process are you doing everything? Yeah. Right? And, and what I wrote about too in my book um, is about coming up with goals that are like heart goals. That, that's what I kind of shifted from. And it's crazy to see like how different I am now compared to when I was at Stanford, for example, and I had to count down until the Olympic Games, you know, and every morning I'd get up and like take a day off and I was doing it like a thousand days out, you know? Yeah. And I realized like, man, I'm putting so much pressure on one day, you know, like. And my, 
I want to enjoy my life and not just have my whole life be revolving around this this one day, you know? Yeah. So, um, and also too, it's just very frustrating because you try and control things. You try and control how fit you get, how you're going to feel on race day. But like running is just a bit of a mystery. It's like some of my best races. I don't know why I felt so good, but I did, you know? And some of the times when I was like, man, I was so fit. Why didn't it click that day in the marathon? Like, I don't know. So you got to be like, okay with, with a little bit of mystery there. Yeah. Yeah. So you you made a few quotes through the years and I want to ask you just about a few of these because they're, they're very insightful. And and I would like for you just to kind of go a little bit behind what you're thinking And, and and this is the one I told my son the other night is you made the quote, how you define hard is going is going to determine how you experience hard. And from what I understand, you don't use that word very much. The word hard. Go go a little deeper into that quote. Yeah. Yeah. So the kind of backstory behind that is like as a kid, when I was training, I remember I would be like, man, I'm running 40 miles a week. And it felt like a ton, you know, and I'm super tired. I'm like, I can't imagine running more than this. And then I'd hear about a guy like Dathan, who's my same year in high school, who's a future American record holder in the 5k and still running phenomenally. And I'd hear about him doing like 70 or 80 miles a week. And all of a sudden you're like, "Eh, it's not that hard, you know? So like, like your perception of what's hard changes based on you know, what you're exposed to. Another example of this was uh, after I retired from pro running, I signed up for this crazy challenge, seven marathons, seven days, seven continents. And I didn't train for it at all. My longest run was eight miles leading up to that. And I just run like three days a week. So my weekly mileage was probably like 20 miles a week. And I was training to run 100 or I was going to have to run 183 miles, I believe it is in that week. And uh, I was getting pretty nervous as as the competition was getting closer and closer, but not nervous enough to actually train. I was like, no, I want to see how hard this can be, you know. Um, But I remember during that time, I got this book. It's called like Iron Cowboy. And this guy does 50 Ironman triathlons in 50 days in 50 states. And I was like, okay, seven marathons, seven days, seven con, it sounds hard, but relative to that, like it's, it's nothing, you know, like this is, I can breeze through this. So, um, it's just, it's amazing how the people that you surround you yourself with can shape your perception of like what you think of as being hard training. Cause when I'm training by myself running like 40 miles a week, I felt like, well, I'm training so hard. Yeah. But then all of a sudden you put me with a group where everyone's running 70, 80, 90 miles a week. And it's just the new normal. It's like, I oh, know everyone just trains this way. So, but you got to give yourself grace too, because, you know, it's a process for me where, you know, my new normals were being reestablished you know, time after time after time. And it was a gradual stepping process. You know, I didn't go from running 20 miles a week to a hundred miles a week. It took years and years to build there. So you gotta be patient with yourself too and be like, okay, I can't just like not think this is going to be hard and then expect to be able to go out and run a marathon, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you, you got to embrace the process. So you talked about, I've actually got it down here later, but we'll go ahead and park there now. The seven marathons, and seven days on seven continents. What were you thinking? <laughs> yeah, so I, it's funny. It was kind of full circle for me. And that was kind of the bookend of, of my career. I'd already retired from running professionally, but the way things ended, it just didn't go how I was hoping it would go. I always pictured like running my last marathon, having it be a really good marathon, getting down on my knees at the finish line, taking off my shoes and walking away barefoot. And I never had that opportunity. I never got to say goodbye to it. So it kind of felt like an open chapter in my life that, you know, wasn't totally closed Um, until one day I was doing some weights because I got into weightlifting after I retired from from pro running. And I got a text message from Pastor Matthew Barnett, who's my friend. He's the pastor at the Dream Center in Los Angeles. And I just love the work that they're doing down there at the Dream Center, helping people get off the streets in, in Los Angeles. And uh, he's like, hey, I'm doing this crazy race, seven marathons, seven days, seven continents. And uh, yeah, you just tell me about it and how crazy it's going to be. I was like, there's something about it. There's very similar to the moment when I was 13 and had that vision to try and run around the lake where something about that just grabbed me. And so I texted him right back. I was like, oh man, that sounds amazing. Like, let me know. And the running didn't sound amazing, but just like the whole experience yeah. and traveling around the world in a week. And there's something just, and the epic challenge of it, you know, I'd never, 
usually we run two marathons a year and that's like a lot, you know? So the thought of doing seven back to back to back was just like, whoa, this would be intense, you know? Um, but there's something to just grab me. And so I text him back. He's like, hey, let me know if you want company. And he texts right back. He's like, yeah, you should totally come. And things just kind of took off from there. And um, it was an interesting week, you know, having not trained for it at all. It, I was actually getting in better shape as the week was going on. So we started our first day in Antarctica and we we're moving all over the world. And day five in Morocco was actually my fastest uh, race. I believe it was like 304 or something like that. Wow. And then uh, I got a stress reaction that day though. And so my next two marathons I ran with a stress reaction in my hip. So my last marathon in Sydney was like five and a half hours and super long, super painful, very similar to the 15 mile run around the lake, really lots of stops involved. And uh, it, was a, it was a big struggle just to make it to the finish line, but I'll never forget finally making it to the finish in Sydney and getting down on my knees, taking my shoes off, just like I'd always pictured doing, even though it wasn't really a good race for me, you know? Um, taking my shoes off, walking away. And it felt like that was like a clear kind of end to that season of my life and kind of launched me into this new season of life of being an author, um, focusing on being a good dad, a good husband, and I'm also doing some coaching in Flagstaff, Arizona now. So I kind of learned that you know, what you experience and learn in one season of life is meant to be pulled into the next season yeah. of life. So it's really neat to see like all of that stuff wasn't just for me to experience, but it's for me to take and then now to like give it back out to other people and help and encourage other people. Yeah. So you started your career and you ended your career with epic runs. Basically. Yes, that's, yes. Uh, that's pretty <laughs> awesome. Um, what you believe about yourself is going to determine where you go in life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of goes back to that moment when I was 13. And I believe that I'd run with the best guys in the world. Um, having that belief, like it just, I couldn't help it, but to let it come out. Right. And I think about like how often maybe there's certain behaviors that of mine that I don't like and that I want to change. And I'm just so focused on like avoiding that behavior or trying to clean that behavior up rather than like addressing the heart and like what's actually going on inside of here that's making me act this way. Um, it's, it's always a temptation for me to be like, I'm just going to address like what's physically going on. But really like, and I think Jesus taught this, like everything flows out of our heart. You know, he was all about our heart and us getting clean on the inside. Um, so th that's just like very foundational belief that I've always had is, and the question I like to ask myself, like, what am I believing about myself in this moment? Because I believe beliefs aren't like a one time thing. Like, yes, I had the one time belief when I was 13, but it takes cultivation of those beliefs. You know, it's a daily like monotonous, like every single day being like, I'm choosing to believe this. I don't feel like believing this today because I'm going through X, Y, and Z, but I'm going to choose this belief and I'm going to hang on to it. And I'm going to cultivate it. I'm going to let it grow kind of like that run you just don't want to get up and do yeah yeah it's, yeah. Uh, yeah and we all have those days it's know? crazy um when i could get outside of myself i was much better at managing pain yeah i i like to describe my job as a professional pain manager when i was running professionally um because that's really the name of the game right it's like how hard can you push yourself and how hard can you push your body? And what I found is in my moments of most excruciating pain um, that I've experienced, whether it be mile 20 of Boston or, you know, in routes running 206 for the marathon in London, I would be in extreme pain and I'd be, I'd become very like internal and I'm just focused so much on my own pain, my own suffering. And then my perception of my own pain increases. And so I had to find a way to get my focus off of me and put it onto someone else. Because when I was focused on someone else, I wasn't thinking about my pain. I was thinking about how much I love this other person. So oftentimes, you know, we have a lead vehicle in front of us and there'd be a cameraman on the back of it. And I'd literally be staring at this camera and thinking about like Sarah, my wife, who's watching me or my little brother who's watching me at home, you know, and I think about how much I love them and how much they've invested in me for this moment. And it was my love for them that I was going to push through this pain because I 
it just allowed me to get outside myself. And there's lots of different ways I could go about doing that. Like I remember very vividly in 2009, New York City Marathon is having a really bad race for I don't know why reason. It was totally mysterious, you know, back in like 16th place at mile like 15 into the race and just pouting to God, you know, and being like, oh, I'm so frustrated. Why is this happening? Like, I don't understand what's going on. And, uh, but then I remembered why I was running and that was the first race I ran for the Hall Steps Foundation, which we had just started. And so every single dollar was going to go towards projects of alleviating poverty all over the world. And, uh, and I was like, this is why I'm out here. And like my mind flashed back to my previous trip to Zambia and seeing the kids in tattered clothes and how we were able to bring clean water to them, uh, you know, through a group of people running for team world vision at the Chicago marathon. And I was like, this is why I'm out here. And it allowed me to get outside myself, my body physically relaxed and I started to perform a lot better. So, um, I'm just, and it also too, I think Jesus did the same thing, you know, it says that he endured the cross for the joy set before him. And I think about like, well, what was that joy that Jesus was set on, you know? And I think, you know, it doesn't say in the Bible what it is, but I think it was, it was me, it was you, it was everyone. Yeah. So I think that's the way to get through our moments of greatest struggle, greatest physical pain is to, to set our love and affection on someone else. Yeah. So, so you, I, I, and we're not going to go all the way through these quotes, but um, you talk a lot about the mental side of the sport. You know, I, I had a opportunity several years ago to 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 attempt to run a hundred mile treadmill run, oh. um, and long story short, I didn't I didn't make it through the whole thing. I, I had a stress fracture, but I, I called a friend of mine when I when I accepted the challenge. It was kind of one of those like your pastor friend. It was yeah. a buddy of mine, almost a dare. Yeah, and I, yeah. sure, well, I, and but I called a friend of mine who does a lot of these ultra distance races, and I said, Jeff, I said, can I do that? He said, if you can run a marathon, you can run a hundred miles. Yeah, as long as you think you can. Yeah, <laughs> and and you 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 talk about. I mean, a lot of your quotes and a lot of things I've heard you talk about is the mental side mm-hmm. of the sport. How how important on a scale? is the mental side versus physical? Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, you know, there, you got to have both, you know? It's like, especially, it depends on what your goals are. Like, if your goal is to survive something, you can survive a lot of things just off mental strength alone. Like like me, for example, my seven marathons, like I could get through it because like I was strong up here, but I wasn't going to be running 220 marathons. Like physically, it wasn't there. It wasn't in the cards. So you got to have both, you know, and the two affect each other. Like we're a holistic person with mind, body, spirit, and all of that is just like you, you can't separate one, you know? Um So, yeah, I'd say it depends on what your goals are. But what I found for myself is, like, I just learned that, like, I can't focus too far down the road. Like, there's this great uh, Dedrick Bonhoeffer quote that I just love, and he talks about, like, I don't look at the road in in front of me that's too hard for me. I look at Jesus, who's right in front of me, and I say, he leads the way, I will follow. And I I would reflect back on that quote all the time because I would get overwhelmed by the challenge. And I can imagine, like, if you're trying to do 100 miles on a treadmill and you're at mile, like, 24 and you're hurting, being like, like this isn't physically possible. Like your mind would just convince you of that over time, right? But the truth of the matter is like you can take one more step unless you have a stress fracture and then maybe it's better (laughs) to step off the treadmill, you know? And there's a time and place for that, you know? Like I stepped out of the Olympic Games in 2012 and God was telling me like live to fight another battle another day. So I think you do have to be smart with your mind. You know, it's not just about like drilling your body into the ground into submission every single time. It's more about like partnering with your body. Um, but so I, on the starting line marathons, I was always like freaking out on the inside because I'm thinking about how hard it's going to be at mile 23, 24, 25. And what I have to tell myself all the time is the title of my new book, Run the Mile You're In. And I would just tell myself, just do a great job with what you're doing right now. Like the grace is here for this moment. It's not here for mile 23 yet. Like it'll be there when I get there, but let me just do a great job with what I'm doing right now. Be fully present in this moment and try and maximize what I'm doing. And I'll worry about that part when I get there. Cause it's really the worry about the struggle and the, the, thing that you're trying to take on that's worse than actually going through it you know 
That's, uh, That's pretty telling. Yeah. yeah, before we move on from the mental side, because I, I love the mental side of running, um, I, I coach a, a group of junior triathletes, and, and some of them race at the elite level. And what I tell them is, is when you show up for these races, everybody's fast. Everybody wants it. It's who's willing to hurt the most. And you, you mentioned a while ago, you call yourself a, a professional pain manager. Ex, explain in your own words what that means <laughs> in the moment, in the race, yeah. to want it more than the guy running next to you. There's, I think as a professional pain manager, you have to have a whole bunch of different tools you can pull on. Because sometimes I'll try one thing, like thinking about other people, trying to love them, focus on that, and it won't work. And I'm like, okay, I need to go to something else, you know? And so other things I would go to is just like, I'll literally visualize myself back in training because that helps me relax and take pressure off the, what I'm currently feeling, you know? Um, so sometimes that would work. If that didn't work, um, another tool that I do all the time is just try and turn my brain off. I would just tell myself simple things. I'm like, just put one foot in front of the other as fast as you can. And like literally try not to think at all. Like I remember hearing an interview with Michael Phelps and they're asking him, what do you think about when you're in the pool? And he's like, I'm not thinking about anything. <laughs> yeah. I'm just in the moment going, you right. know? And sometimes like our mind, we just need to quiet it down and, and totally turn it off. So, and you learn these tools and what works well for you. Cause you know, what works for me might be a little bit different than what works for you, but you learn this in training. You know, you put yourself in those situations where you are suffering and you got to figure out how you're going to get through this moment. You shouldn't let that moment only come in a race. Because right. then, you know, you, what you haven't done in practice, you're not going to be able to magically pull it out of your, yeah. your hat on race day. So um, it's just something where you should just be aware of that. Like, well, what, what is it for me that works for me when I'm suffering? What, what motivates me to get through those moments and try a lot of different things and have like five or six different tactics that you're going to go to? Like when I'm suffering, I'm going to try this. If that doesn't work, I'm going to go to this and this and this and this and uh yeah, eventually something will work. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So your wife, Sarah, is also a pretty good runner. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that how you guys met? Yeah. Right. So Sarah and I met is actually at the California State Meet our senior year in high school. And uh, I had run a race early in the morning, won my race, and I had some kids come up and ask for my autograph afterwards. So I signed my name, put my favorite Bible verse underneath it. Later in the day, Sarah runs, wins her race. Same kids come up with the same piece of paper, ask for her autograph. So she saw my name, which was amazing that she could even read it because I was just like yeah. scribbling it, you know. Um, and she saw I put a Bible verse underneath. And, she, and so she, she's like, oh, this guy's a Christian. And so she uh, got my email from a mutual friend and emailed me just to encourage me in my faith. And, and we're both like California runners and Christians. And so we kind of had that in common. And then we met the next week at the Foot Locker Championships, actually the Western Regional Championships, and uh, and just kind of kept in touch. And then both decided to go to Stanford and then started dating first week of freshman year, dated all the way through college and um, got married three months after we graduated from Stanford and have been together nearly 14 years now. Wow. Now, she's got a few big races coming up. She's... Um... Tell me, tell me a little bit about her career. Yeah, it's been really fun to see Sarah grow. Um, she came to the marathon, I don't know, I mean, it was like five years ago, somewhere right in there. And, um, and she know, was she, a middle distance yeah, runner. She, she's competed in every Olympic trial since 2004, but always in a different event. So I oh, wow. believe in 2004 is the 5K, and then she moved up to like the steeplechase, and then she did 1500 one year, and then uh, the marathon this last time around, and then she tried again in the 10K on the track. So she did it right. She didn't do yeah. 12 miles around the lake. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's gradually worked her yeah. way up. But it's been fun to see her just kind of of steadily improve you know like i think her first marathon in chicago was right around 232 or somewhere right in that range i don't remember exactly what it is and now she's just been every marathon she just gets a little bit stronger a little bit stronger and uh you know ran 226 about a year ago in ottawa and uh and is looking really good you know like the women's running scene is really good in the u.s right now so we have our Olympic trials coming up February 29th in Atlanta. So we're actually heading to Atlanta tonight 
we're going to get on the course for the first time tomorrow morning. She's going to preview the course. But, you know, the goal is to uh, to make a, an Olympic team. It'd be her first Olympics. And it, it would just, you know, it'd be a really nice way to end her career. Um, not that she'll be done for sure, but, you know, we're 30, we're both 36 right now. And so, you know, women tend to age a little bit better than guys. I think it's because they listen to their body more than guys. They don't run 12 miles. In the first <laughs> yeah, <time>. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so she's got some exciting stuff, exciting goals, but, um, you know, kind of like what we're talking about, it's better to like have goals that, you know, you can accomplish every time, like goals of the heart or right. focusing on the process. And she's loving, she's loving the process. Right. Well, before we get into your book, I want to I want to take you back a few years. You know, our our paths first crossed in 2010. I don't even know if you remember my email to you and what it was about. Yeah. And, um, but at the time, I was working on this. Uh, I was teaching a class at my church. Really had no thoughts that it would ever become anything. And 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 God just kept opening doors and opening doors to to ultimately start a a running program called the 5K Challenge. And I. Um, when, when I started the class in my church, I was just using stuff I was finding on the internet because it was for 22 people at my church down the road here. And so when we decided to formally write it and publish it, there were some things that I wanted to use that weren't mine. And I, I knew nothing about copyright and all that. So uh, our publisher said, hey, there's some things you need to get permission to use. And, and one of them is this story by Jill Ewert on Ryan Hall. And there's also some pictures. If you want to use those, you've got to get I mean, I didn't know what to do. You know, I was a builder yeah. here in Dalton, and, yeah. and I had no idea that I would ever be where I'm at. So I thought, well, we'll see if God's really opening these doors. So I, I fired off an email to this guy named Ryan Hall, and in less than 12 hours, yeah. you nice. responded back and said, what do you need? But the the video that that we watch, or that our class watched by Jill Ewer back then, she was she was talking about your when you were training for what you thought was going to be your first marathon. And ultimately you kind of stepped back from the store, from the sport for a while. Um, and, and that God was really revealing a lot of things to you about where you had put, put the sport in your life. I know it's been a lot of years, but kind of walk us back through that time. If, if you yeah. can. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a, I think probably the time you're referring to is, so I was actually at Stanford and I was really struggling with my identity. You know, we talked briefly about identity and how important that is, but I was very much seeing like, what made me special and valuable was that I was fast mm -hmm. and it was based on my performances. So when those weren't happening, my first two years at Stanford, I got really depressed because I looked in the mirror. I didn't like what I saw because I wasn't performing well. And so I got really depressed, thought I could change my depression, get out of it by going back home, you know? And so I thought I could change what's going on here by changing my physical location, which was obviously a mistake. So I went home, got even more depressed. But I remember having a conversation with my pastor at the time. He's like, what was the last thing you know God was telling you to do? And I knew like the last thing I knew for sure God was telling me to do was go to Stanford. And so I was like, all right, I got to go back, you know? So I went back to what I knew God was telling me to do before. And um, as I did that, I started just uh, riding my bike and I'd go down to the Stanford football stadium because there's something about stadiums that just always kind of like captured me, you know? I've just always loved them. Like whether there's people in there, something going on or nothing, you know, I always love to like be in them and like look around and stuff. So I remember going into the stadium and I just have, you know, a notepad and my Bible and I just read and journal. But I started asking God a lot of questions about like how do you see me you know and as I began to hear from him how he saw me it changed how I saw myself and I realized like there is nothing I can do on the track on the roads in running that will make God love me more yeah. and there's nothing I can do that will make him love me less you know like he doesn't judge me based on my performance like he sees me through the blood of Jesus and therefore sees me as like righteous you know even though I'm not even though I mess up but he's seeing me through Jesus you know and so I was like man that's powerful you know like I should see myself that same way and as, as I was able to slowly kind of shift how I saw myself 
my whole identity as a runner changed from, you know, someone who's just totally bogged down with performances and burdened by pressure, self-imposed pressure to have to perform a certain way to someone who's just like totally free and being totally free to like go take risk and go and try and run with the best guys in the world. And if you blow up, go up and it's not a big deal you know it's just not because it doesn't change how important i am it doesn't change how valuable i am it doesn't change anything about me it's something that happened to me it's not it's not who i am and that's something you see um also really tangibly in african athletes who are dominating our sport is they don't wear their failures on their face like after a major marathon whether it's boston chicago new york we have this athlete recovery area where all the elites go to recover and I'll be looking around the room and I see like the Westerners and I can tell like that guy had a bad race, that guy had a good race, you know, it's like very obvious. Whereas like the African guys, I have no idea because like they just don't take it personally. Like they just see failure as something that's like a natural part of getting great at anything. And it's, it's just, it's just a price you pay and so like they're all like sitting around having tea laughing and talking you know and i think that's kind of that inspired me to change my perspective on failure and be like listen failure doesn't change anything about what truly makes me important so i'm free to to go take big risks that's awesome okay so god is he's used uh, this ministry run for god to change the hearts and lives of of many people around the world but there's there's so many people out there who still say, I can't run. Whether it's, I'm too old, I'm too overweight, I'm too busy, you've heard the list. What, what would you say to that person who's middle age, maybe slightly overweight, and they're just saying, I can't do it. Yeah, I think it would, uh, you know, I'd have a conversation with them to learn more about their thought process of why they can't run. Um, cause you know, if there's something physically going on, like, you know, I was talking to one guy today, he's like, I blew out my knee and like, now I can't run. It's like, yeah, you probably shouldn't be running on that. Like, let's, let's try something else. Like, what do you enjoy doing? And I like go with that, you know, but, um, to most people who are just having a hard time, they want to get into running, but they're having a hard time getting into it. Um, I just encourage them like running is like a secret club. It's like, it's, it's it at its worst when you first start and like the first like couple months for six months depends what kind of shape you are in when you start but it's it's hardest right at the get-go you know so if you can push through um and i think that's why like your guys program sounds like a great program where you start just with really small bite-sized step that you know you can accomplish you know and then just grow it from there just slowly 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 and then it's amazing when you have that kind of consistency over a long period of time where you'll look back like a year from now and you'll be like man i can't believe i started with the 60 second run and look at me now running a half marathon a year later you know like i would have never thought in a million years that was possible it's just the power of consistency, getting out the door. And that was something I'd do with myself because there was a lot of afternoons where we trained twice a day, you know, and I'd not feel like going out the door from my afternoon run. And I'd literally just tell myself, like, I'm forcing myself to get out the door, I lace up my shoes, head out the door. And almost every time, like, I was glad I did. And like, I actually felt pretty good, you know. So there are going to be those moments where you got to just – put your head down and be like, there is no option. Like yeah. you are going, you know, like yeah, you take the debater. Say, yeah, no, yeah. no. You've written a new book, second book. Yeah. Run the mile you're in. Is this, I'm assuming that's Antarctica. That's me in Antarctica, Antarctica. day one. Yeah. The longest week of my life. So, <laughs> so tell me about this book and how it, how it came to be. Yeah. So, you know, I kind of mentioned, talked about briefly before like that kind of clear bookmark end of my career and uh as i kind of transition into the next phase of my life i was thinking about like all that god has taught me about how to maximize my own potential for me it was in running you know but i think it's relatable to anyone who's just wants to be the best version of themselves in whatever area of life you know and it's like, man, God's like taught me so much through my experiences. So I just, uh, you know, sat down, I would have a coffee every morning, 5 a.m. My house is nice and quiet. And my mantra is like, nothing can stop me at 5 a.m., you know, because my phone's not going off, no distractions. So I just get up and just write for like an hour or two every day. And I was just like, 
just trying to let God just kind of flow through me, help me remember some of the lessons, the experiences that I had, and then the the powerful life transforming truths He taught me through those moments to share with people, so that you know can encourage them as they're on their own personal journey. And I, I thought a lot about like my 13 year old self when I first got into the sport. I can remember very vividly uh, doing hill reps in my hometown, Big Bear, and it was snowing, and I was all by myself. It was like dusk outside, you know, kind of like one of those magical runs, you know, and I was just sprinting up and down this hill over and over again. I remember having this thought. I was like, I wonder what it's going to take for me to go to the Olympics, you know, to be the best that I can possibly be because I didn't know any Olympians. Like this is like before internet had even really gotten going. So, you know, there wasn't as much information as, as is floating around now. And, uh, and I just remember being really, like, intrigued by that. I was like, wow, well, how do people do it, you know? And so now it's fun for me to get to reflect back on and, and remember all those lessons and having lived it to be like, this is what it takes. And these are the lessons, the principles that you have to learn along the way in order to maximize your potential. And then get to share that with other people as their own journey, their own journey is, is really super fulfilling for me. It's been great to finally get, you know, I, this was kind of like my baby where I was crafting it for three months and then editing process by the end is all like nine month to a year process and then to finally like launch it into the world and and be hearing how it's encouraging people is just like oh man like i'm so so glad that i took the time to to craft this thing and shape it and mold it and now put it out into the world so for all the people out there wondering they're they're probably thinking well ron hall he's a superhuman marathoner. He probably didn't write this book himself. He might've had a ghostwriter. This was you and a computer. <laughs> it was me and a computer. You know, I did have some editors. Oh yeah. Um, I think I had two different editors look it over and give me their feedback on it. But no, that was, that was my baby. And part of me was going back and forth. Cause I was like, I am a professional runner, not a author, you right. know? So I was like, I want it to be done like really well. But luckily I had some amazing editors that helped with that process. But you know, all the thoughts, all the ideas, all the storytelling was all just me sharing yeah. from my heart. Now, if you're like me with, with my first project, when I got it back from the editors, it looked like my ninth grade literature teacher <laughs> just, I really felt smart after I got that back. So uh, yeah, remember. editors are yeah. great. I remember That's, uh, being scared every time I'd open the email and look at it. I'm like, <laughs> track changes. Or, yeah. 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 Um, so you've been, you've always been very outspoken in your belief in Jesus Christ. How, how would you sh- say that that shaped your career? Man, I mean, like God is a part of my story and my running from day one when I was 13 and he gave me that vision to run around the lake. So for me, it's just more a matter of being honest with anyone who wants to follow my story, you know, and when I was still running professionally, I felt like it was my duty to be honest about my faith and how that was plain because it was very much very real, like playing out. Um, And I wanted to be real with people about that and not be hiding it because like going back to my 13 year old self, like I want to know an Olympian. I want to know what makes them tick. I want to know what helps them get through these moments. And if we don't share what it is that truly helps us get through it and the answer is God, then we're like doing a disservice to our fans, you know, or to people who are following and and want to know what's going on inside of us. So to me, it's just always like trying to be authentic and real with people. And, you know, I don't try and work God into the conversation, but he comes up over and over again as part of the conversation because he's a very real and active person in my life. Um, So, you know, I, I hope that people can, you know, whether they agree with, you know, my view of God and Christianity or not, like it's still something that they can, uh, that resonates with them and can inspire them and um, that they can receive in kind of a non-threatening way. Wow. Yeah. So no kids to four kids Yeah. overnight. Yeah. So tell us a little about Hannah, Mia, Jasmine, and Lily. I got a chance to meet them this morning. Just yeah. Beautiful, awesome young girls. Just tell Tell me a little bit about them and how how that come to be. Yeah, they're amazing kids. So it was actually on our first date at Stanford, Sarah and I were talking and we weren't like having a serious conversation. Like we were just kind of getting to know each other. But Sarah mentioned, she's like, I've always wanted to adopt. Like ever since I was a little kid, like I have pictures of me with all these like little kids holding hands with them from the time she was a child. 
And I was like, whoa, like, because I adoption is just totally off my grid. Like no one in my family was adopted. None of my friends were. So I just didn't see it at all growing up. So it just like wasn't even on my radar, you know, whereas Sarah, like there was some adoptive kids in her family and friends and all of that. So um, she just always had the heart for it. And it's during that time that I started to kind of chew on it and be like, well, is like adoption something I'd be open to doing or not? And, uh, you know, fast forward to, you know, we were married and married about 10 years before we decided it is the right time for us to have kids. And we decided we want to start the adoption process. And during that time, we'd been training in Ethiopia and just kind of fell in love with the people and the culture and the country. And um, one thing that broke our hearts, though, was seeing all these kids on the street in Addis and seeing them, you know, not having a good shake at life and being like, well, what can we do about this? So we decided that we'd adopt from Ethiopia. We we're originally just going to adopt like an infant, you know, start where most people start. And uh, and then, but same deal, we went back to Ethiopia to train, visited these orphanages, and we're number 76 on a wait list to get an infant. And meanwhile, we go to this orphanage and there's all these older kids, older, like being like, like, four to our oldest daughter is 15, but being that age range and they're all waiting for families. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Like I'm waiting for my kid and they're waiting for a family. Like, why are we all waiting here? <laughs> you know? And uh, after meeting the kids and interacting with them, I was like, these kids are so amazing. Like I'd take any one of these kids home in a second. So we went home, we changed all of our paperwork up. And during that time we became aware of uh, our daughters, our daughters to be, um, is four sisters, and they'd been in an orphanage for about three and a half years, and uh, and they were talking about splitting them up. So they're going to send two to one country, two to another country, because they couldn't find a family that would take all of them. And you know, coming from big families, like it's not okay to split up siblings like that, you know. And and it was kind of. It was a similar moment that I would feel when I'd go to the front of a major marathon, you know, and into the lead. It's like there's a little bit of scariness and like like you're jumping off a cliff kind of a feel. But I always like to tell people like for me, there's always the either I could follow the path of fear and not run how I knew I was supposed to run or I could follow the path of love and follow the love that God's put in my heart. And I just felt, you know, love in my heart for our girls at that time. And I was like, I'm gonna follow love. And I've never been disappointed when I follow love, mm-hmm. you know, compared to following fear. So, you know, we just, uh, we just dove in and we actually went to Ethiopia and hung out with our girls without telling them we we're thinking about adopting them um, just so they could get to know us on kind of neutral terms, you know. And so after a week of them just getting to know us, uh, we invited them into this nursing office and a nurse was translating because they didn't know English at the time. And uh, we just invited them into our family because it's something that's really important. We wanted them to have a choice in all of this because so far everything's been happening to them. They're reacting, you know. And much in the same way we are choosing them, we wanted them to choose us. So we invited them into our family, asked if they would like to be adopted by us. And of course, you know, they were screaming and yelling and like so, so excited. So um, that was one of the most precious moments of my life when we told them. And that was the beginning of our family being born. And that was three and a half years ago. So now they're, you know, here in the States and in school and um, thriving in school. And they've all learned English. English and um, have just come come so far. But our family, it, what's been crazy to me is just how natural it's all felt. Like even being like a biracial family, mm-hmm. I thought that, you know, there'd probably be moments where we're out in public and you're kind of like aware of that, you know, and maybe like people like kind of looking at you or whatever. But like, I just don't even feel it at all. Like I have to remind myself we're a biracial family and that we're not um, a biological family mm-hmm. just because it feels so normal and natural to me so it's been kind of a supernatural experience that way that's got to be encouraging though you know it's right yeah you know yeah when you don't even you're not even aware of that yeah um so to the to the young man the young lady out there who's got olympic in their eyes they're dreaming about it they're what, what would you say to the young person today yeah who has dreams of of doing what you've done or doing what Sarah's done? What would you say to that person? 
I would just say, um, you know, I was a big dreamer, you know, dreaming of the Olympics and you're talking about someone with big dreams. Like you have to develop an equally big part of you that is resilience. Because what I found is like becoming an Olympian is not about like, I mean, it is, you got to qualify, right? I mean, the top three, but it's not about like, just like winning everything. It's about getting up after disappointment, after disappointment, failure after failure. Um, a verse that I'd pull on all the time when I was going through through my own journey was, though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. And I just love that verse. And that verse kind of perplexed me for a long time because I was like, righteous people like don't fall. Like, why does it describe this person as being righteous? You know, <laughs> like that's... I, it's like contradictory, you know, but as I was kind of like chewing on it with God a little bit, I felt like he was telling me, no, it's his identity that he saw himself as righteous that allowed him to get back up over and over and over again. So it's kind of like what we were talking about before, where it's like, what do you believe about yourself? Because what you believe about yourself is going to come up, come out. So that's encourage like people with that kind of a dream be resilient, but more than anything, like figure out who you are, what makes you special and how unshakable that is so that when you do fall, because you will fall, you will go through struggles. Everyone does. Yeah. You you can pick yourself back up over and over and over again. Yeah. Okay. So I reached out to some of our instructors and I said, give me some questions. And it's kind of funny, the range of questions you get. (laughs) And we'll kind of go a lightning round of these as we're winding down. First one is, what do you think about when you run? Well, we kind of chatted about that a little bit. Like I said, sometimes I'm not thinking about anything. Just turn my mind off. Um, Other times, especially early on in a race, like say if I'm running a marathon the first 20 miles of the race, I'm thinking about trying to be as relaxed as humanly possible. So I'm thinking about relaxing my face, relaxing my arms, shaking out my shoulders. Like, because what happens is as the race unfolds, a lot of times you'll just keep getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And like, you got to do something physically to like get yourself just relax. You know, like you watch Olympic sprinters and their face is like jello, you know, like our body was meant to perform well when it's relaxed. So really like, focusing on relaxing everything that I'm not using in that moment or even like in my stride it's like your quads get a break when it's off the ground like try and make it as relaxed as possible and it hits the ground try to contract really hard you know like focusing on the process yeah yeah Yeah. and staying in the moment you know focus on what you're doing right now like don't worry too far down the road yeah next question is uh the two hour barrier Uh, I think Nike just did a uh almost a lab test yeah uh, yeah. and it it came close yeah but but not quite there when do you think that will be broken in a race that's a great question i think it'll be in our lifetime for sure depending on how long i live (laughs) um but yeah it was i think it's one of those things where it's like we've talked about it's a mindset shift where all of a sudden guys are going out in 60 minutes or 59 high and they're not thinking about it being like a death march like people have thought about it five years ago even Mm -hmm. you know now going out in 61 minutes is like pretty pretty par for the course if you're on a flat fast course with the best guys in the world whereas like i said like five years ago you'd be like dude you're committing suicide going out that fast so it's something where it's got to be evolving mindset and we got to see guys like kipchoge get close and see hey this actually is possible you know but i think i think we're going to see it and i think we're going to see it sooner than most people are predicting do you think it's going to be you know when roger banister broke the four minute mile it was like that can't be done and then he did it and and then in fairly rapid succession after that more and more people started to do do you think that's going to be how the two hour is one guy does it and then it becomes more common i don't i don't think so actually i think this scenario it's like the level of talent that you have to have in order to run a sub two hour marathon is so extraordinary that i don't think there's that many people walking on the planet that have that kind of ability um you know whereas running a four minute mile is a great feat but it's like there's lots of kids in high school doing that now and so it's like you don't have to be a genetic freak to run a sub four hour marathon to run a sub two hour marathon you're gonna have to be 
the freakiest of the genetic freaks yeah. to do it. Yeah. So um, I think it will help, you know, and I think it will help people get closer and closer. And we might see a couple guys maybe yeah. do it um, off the, you know, right away. But I mean, ideally, if we can have two guys going after it at the same time in the same race, because they're going to need to be pushing each other all the way to the finish line in order to to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. The next question, of course, you were we, we talked about you at length in, in our first 5K challenge. How many crazy run for God people have come up to you and asked for your autograph? <laughs> I've met I a few. I feel like we've known I've each other uh by the pictures that I get, because everybody always sends me <laughs> their picture. Yeah. I got an autograph with Ryan. From Expos, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When I do race Expos, I definitely get, you know, I'd say one maybe every, you know, I do like hour signings or whatever, yeah. and I usually get about one Run For God, or at least like I see the shirt all the yeah. time. Yeah, it's everywhere. So, but I love meeting Run For God athletes. It's yeah. super fun. You know, like we share something in common yeah. that is really powerful, and um, it's fun to encourage each other on our journeys. Yeah. Now I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to finish up with without getting you to tell us a little bit about the Hall Steps Foundation. Tell yeah. us. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So we started the Hall Steps Foundation in 2010, as I mentioned. You know, running in New York for the first time. Um, but really, like that was the answer to the second part of my vision of like giving a, g- a gift to run with the best guys in the world, but giving that gift so I could help other people. But it wasn't until after 2008 Beijing Olympics I saw how tangibly you can actually help other people through running. When uh, Sarah and I served as ambassadors for Team World Vision at the Chicago Marathon in 2008 and uh, raised enough money to bring clean water to 90,000 people in Zambia. And I remember we got to go to Zambia after Beijing. I remember being at a borehole, like ribbon cutting ceremony. And this villager was talking to me. He's like, man, I'm so grateful you guys brought clean water to us. He's like, because you guys did this. Now the average life expectancy in my household is supposed to rise by 10 years. And I was thinking, how crazy is that? They like, we can all run a race and like fundraise and support. And now like 90,000 people are all going to live 10 years longer. Like that's how you like tangibly, very tangibly make a difference and an impact through running. So we know we wanted to continue to support World Vision like we do, but we also wanted to do more and get involved in other projects as well. So we started the Hall Steps Foundation and that's essentially it's like Sarah and I running that and Sarah, you know, runs it for the most part but so it's you know we're volunteers we don't pay ourselves so it's cool it's like every single dollar people raise goes towards the projects that we're involved in and we've done projects like we built a health clinic in kenya um we've done a maternity ward in senegal we've done a lot in ethiopia with child care because actually after we brought home our kids from ethiopia they closed down international adoption um, so now, you know, their country is having to take care of all of these orphans that they have there. And so, you know, we've been involved in helping them kind of try to figure out a foster care system and just how they're going to take care of all these kids. And that's something we want to do uh, post running, you know, when Sarah's done running, we'll, we would like to, to get over to Ethiopia and do more work um, over there, maybe start a school or something like that. But um, so people can run for the Steps Foundation any race that they want to do. Um, you know, they just create a fundraising page on on our website. Uh, it's the stepsfoundation.org. If people want to check it out, we send them a uniform and they're off and running, you know. But yeah. um, it just, it's, and, and it doesn't even have to be our foundation. I just encourage people like, find something that you're running for, you know, something that's not just you. Because like I said, a lot of times, like I can't control what happens on the day, but if I'm doing it, that's ultimately going to benefit someone else. It's very rewarding whether I ran well or not, you know, I'm like, this was all worth it because it was about someone else and helping someone else. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Okay. So the last question you're coaching now. Yeah. Um, which daughter? Uh, Hannah, but Hannah. I only coach her in the off season. Cause she has a good high school coach. Good, good but, high school cross yeah. country coach. How, how do you think your coaching has been influenced? And I really want to know this because I coach a, a group of kids. How do you think that's been influenced from your career as an elite runner? Uh-huh. How do you see things different than a lot of coaches that you see? Yeah. Man, well, I definitely I pull on all my experiences, you know, and the things that I did, like, it's, it's so easy, right, to look back at it in hindsight and be like, I did X, Y, and Z wrong. 
And now like I know those things. And so obviously I'm not prescribing X, Y, and Z to my athletes, you know? So, um, but also too, I think I, a big mistake I made throughout my career was not being flexible. So like, for example, I'd get a training plan. I had to follow every single day, no matter how I was feeling, no matter what kind of little injury I had going on, like there was no adjustments, you know? And now as a coach, I, I, that's something that kind of maybe sets me apart about being a little bit different. It's like, I am constantly changing workouts. Like Sarah had two hard workouts last week. I changed both of them. Like as I was based on what I was seeing, you know? And I think that's so important because there is a science aspect of our sport for sure. And we need to pay attention and learn from that. Um, but there's also a equally big, if not even bigger, yeah, logic, or I call it artistic approach yeah. to training where it's like, you're making a painting with this workout, you know, like, how do I accomplish the purpose of this workout given where my athlete is at today? And it takes a lot of tweaking. So um, that, that that's probably what sets me apart is different. And also, I just love like to involve the Holy Spirit and things I'm doing. And so when I'm writing training for my athletes, I'm literally like, having a conversation with God and be like, what does this athlete need right now? You mm -hmm. know, and trying to involve the spirit in everything that I'm doing. Yeah, some of our athletes get upset because I I have a a workout schedule for the whole season, uh -huh, but they uh -huh. never get to see it. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, they're, they're gonna be, hold me to this, this, right. and this. And you're right, it's, it's gotta change based on how they feel and what's yeah. going on in their life and stress. And uh, well, Ryan, I tell you what, this has been, a uh, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah. It's been very insightful. It's awesome to get to meet you. Yeah, I can send I know, all these finally. instructors who have sent me pictures. <laughs> I can send them pictures back, them back now. But uh, I, I wish you well in everything you do. I'm glad you're a brother in Christ. Yeah. And uh, thank you for all that you do. Yeah, and thank you for what you're doing with uh, Run for God. Like, it's been a big encouragement. The people in the program have been a big encouragement to me throughout my career. And so I just appreciate what you're doing and um, how you're bringing Christian athletes all together under under one flag. So keep doing what you're doing. All right. Well, thank you, Ryan. All right. Take thanks. care. All right.